Hello everyone, I want to welcome you to my YouTube channel. This is Steve coming back with another video. Um, so what I do need to do, obviously do is give you an update, which is long overdue, I know. I've been in training for the last two weeks on my job. I was trying to um, basically rehash what I was trying to learn. I mean, it's kind of on a personal level, but this is what's been going on. A lot of my time has been consumed with training and because I had switched departments recently. So that training is coming to an end right now. So I'm just kind of grateful it's over. The position didn't work out, but, you know, I'm just going back to where I came from. So um, things work out for whatever reasons, and I'm willing to accept that. Still have my job. That's good. So anyways, uh, moving forward here on this note, um, first of all, I wanted to kind of explain what this video is going to be about. Um, maybe it's not fully prepared, and excuse me for that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a project, a demo that somebody had actually recently sent to me. And to kind of give you the story on this, um, back last year, I believe it was probably about a year ago, maybe a little bit less than a year, maybe nine months ago, we were working on a project called the Breakout Clone. Me and a few other people were doing it. It was Darren, it was Bo, and I think we were the only ones doing it. But we were working on this Breakout Clone. And I was the one that kind of discarded it and kind of went in my own direction. So anyways, the other person that originally had the idea for the clone because it was originally created in BASIC, he actually finished it. So I'm going to kind of demonstrate that for you tonight as one part of the video. Um, the other part of the video, um, to stay consistent with the Commodore 64 theme, is just um, what I've decided to do. Um, oh, and before I do that, let me explain about the Machine Language Project because I know people are going to ask me about that to give you an update on that. So the Machine Language Project is still a go. We're not changing any of that. That's still going to keep moving forward. But right now I'm working with um, different people from all over walks of life and stuff like that. And we know that Siggy is the main person in charge of the project. And I just have to mention he's um, been consumed with a lot of work right now. So I'm trying to keep in contact with him. He said he wanted to do one tonight, but he wasn't really sure if he could make it. And anyways, um, I had a pretty stressful day, so I decided to kind of roll that out for this week. But I'm going to definitely, definitely try to get this going next week. Um, I'm sure he's been working on a lot of code. Now, Darren also has been working on the sprite graphics, and he's the one that created this breakout clone I'll show to you. He's done some pretty amazing things with these sprites. I can't wait to implement them in. I'm trying to come up with some corny names for our Spelunker clone here or whatever. We've also got people, as you already know, if you haven't been watching the videos, actually that are going to be working on the audio and like the sound or the music in the background and also we have somebody's going to be doing like the title screen he's done demos and he's really good so looking forward to this um also i want to put it out there if you're still welcome to join this project um what i am looking for at this time um is actually people who are really good at management too i probably need to divide my tasks with management i'm trying to keep the team together but if somebody's got really good skills and there's management maybe if you're a manager or whatever i'd like to um, welcome you aboard um it pays to really know something about the commerce 64. i just don't want somebody just come in and say hey i'm a manager and i'm going to do good it's like well you should have a passion for this stuff because that's the whole pur purpose of this channel um which is um some of the other cool things that's happening on the market um, somebody introduced recently that there was a, a small blurb of my YouTube channel, and I thought it was a magazine, but I don't know what it was, so maybe I could just throw that up real quick if you want to see it. But um, I had mentioned this before, I think I have mentioned this, but I did have an interview back in November with Commodore Free Magazine, and I'm still waiting on that. I'm going to contact um, Nigel, who's the one that's in charge of the, he, I guess he's like the editor or whatever, in charge of the magazine and see if that's still going to fly, because he said he was supposed to get out in the next issue. The most recent issue I've seen updated on the CommodoreFree.com is actually issue 95, and it's kind of been there for a while, so I don't know what's going on, or if that could become a reality, because I think it would be awesome if this channel could just grow across the board, and we could unite so many people and bring them together. Um, building, like I said, as I mentioned this before, week after week, game projects and just stuff like that. Okay, I'm going to say the word game, because I know we're moving toward that direction. But anyways, game projects for the Commodore 64 to keep that consistent. Now, on another note, I don't want to get too sporadic, and I don't want to get off topic in any way or go off on a tangent. But there are people still watching my Atari videos on this channel, too. Now, I do have an Atari YouTube already dedicated, if you want to check that out. Maybe I'll throw that in the description here. I usually do have it in, down in the description below, of course. 
but I don't really know if I could tackle that. I'm hoping to be able to create some simple Atari stuff. I do have some discs, but I don't have like an S drive for my Atari, so I can't transfer that information over. I'd actually have to copy it by hand or just create simple demos, but I do have probably a good um, 30 or 40 different programs on these discs. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I don't know, we'll work something out, but I don't want to be dragged in so many directions. I've learned to kind of stick with my guns, you know, and stick with the important stuff, which is Commodore 64, which is why I think this channel is working in some way, because somebody online, her name is Lisa Irby, if you don't know her, she um, runs her own business online, but it's kind of a, a side track from this. But anyway, she is, watching her videos, um, when before I even started this YouTube channel at the beginning, I remember she said, Find a topic and stay consistent with it and don't ever change. That is what will draw people to you. It's not about having random sporadic things, but staying with one thing specifically so people know what you're about. Now somebody also commented on my website said it was kind of in different directions and I know, um, hence the name Programmer Mind, I was trying to probably cover too many things at once. But anyways, let's move forward with the video. I don't want to sit there and rant the entire time. Um, but I hope you guys are still watching this channel. I haven't abandoned you, I promise. Um, I've just been so tasked with work under a lot of pressure and stress. And that's coming to an end because I'm going back to my department and I've got newer training. So that's going to be awesome. But anyways, let me show you that right now. Let's switch over here. Okay, so if you're still with me, we're back. On, and we've got actually CBM PRG Studio uploaded on the screen. For those watching for the first time, CBM PRG Studio is a compiler tool that allows you to run machine language programs on your Commodore 64. In this case, this is the breakout clone that we were working on back in, I don't know what it was, June or whatever. Um, and he's actually completed it, so I'm going to run that and show that to you right now. Um, the code is also available on GitHub, so since he's put it free for everybody, um, go ahead and uh, post the link because he's already got it on there, so I imagine it's not like a hidden secret or anything he doesn't want people to see but Darren thank you so much uh, for the work um, like I said I believe in giving people a shout out whenever they've done something related to Commodore 64 that's the whole purpose of this channel it's not about me it's about you guys it's about bringing people together sharing your ideals across the board so anyways let's take a look here just gonna run it Hopefully I get it to run this time. It was running a little ragged this morning. Okay, there it is. Oh, no, no, that's not it. That's the second part of the, the tutorial here, or the session. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, so I'm back. Um, so this is the breakout clone that Darren has um, created for us. Um, well, he, he created it. So I'm just going to give him credit for it. Um, so... It's basically controlled with the, this is the title screen. Um, it's, you just press the fire button. I'm just using a regular controller. Um, usually what you have to do, and for those who want to know, this is actually Vice C64 emulator. I figured probably be better try to explain things too for people who are new to the channel. So Vice C64 emulator allows you to emulate Commodore 64 programs in an actual, let's say, virtual environment or whatever. So anyways, let me go ahead and set what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to the settings window and change the joystick settings so we can um, activate the joystick here. I'm saying joystick. I am very old school, excuse me. You know, so this is also old school, so it's joystick, but it's set up to the controller here. So I'm going to press the fire button. And whoops, I almost missed the first one. You know what? If you press this key right here, I think it responds to the keyboard. That might have been why it did that, but let's take a look. And it's possible I may break this up into two different videos. I think it might be smart. We'll see. It's got the sound effects in it. I remember we worked on the, the sound to get the right sound for a while there. This is our uh, character graphics. I think the sprite, 
or it might be all character graphics, but I'll probably just have to take a peek at the code. It's been so long since I've seen it. But we originally didn't have the, um, the blocks disappearing. We just had the ball going up there, and I don't think we had them actually disappearing, if I recall. Maybe it was just the bottom row or something. See, it even bounces right off of one block to the next. This should bring back the days, right? This is a this is reminding me of the Atari 2600, which gave me my first passion for computers. Because after that, I went out and bought an Atari computer, and from there, the rest was history. <coughs> I notice the last part is really hard to knock out at the very end. Trying to take out the last block is really a little tricky. You'll see why if I can get a little bit more skilled at this. It's all about that angle where you're hitting the ball, of course. Like, how do you know it's going to hit that one? Okay, I hit it. Cool. Maybe if I angle it against the wall again. Nope. Physics, mathematics, I don't know. I got it this time. Let's see. Oh my goodness. I'm doing much worse than my last time. So, I think I got it this time. Yay! Look at that, I got it. Okay. So it kind of goes into the next round, and scorekeeper's still going. I just wanted to show you. So if I miss it, you get a noise. Let's make it in the game. And there you have it. So, just thought I would show that for Deering's credit. Um, probably taking a part of the code is not something I really want to go into. Because I didn't write a lot of the code, um, it was written by Darren. I might be able to explain various parts of it, and I'll probably get shot down by somebody if I give the wrong information here, but maybe I could give it a shot. Um, so this is the setup screen. This is just changing the background coloring of the screen. It makes it pretty simple to read it and everything. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. But, like I said, he's got everything on GitHub, so if you want to check it out yourself, it's all there. This is setting up the initialization for the paddle. He made this very easy. I'm glad he commented it so well. I can see these are the, the coordinates he's setting up with the X and the Y position, which is what allows the sprite to be positioned on the screen. It is a sprite. Okay, yeah, right there. Sprite zero. Okay, so we got a sprite going. It's got the colors, everything here. And these are what are called jump subroutine timers. Um, or excuse me, this is a timer. I believe this was um, what Siggy was working on, but Darren may have come up with his own. Um, but I remember Siggy was going through that with us. Um, also, he's got the joystick button here. Now, they, like these jump subroutines, if you know basic, they just work like basic. They jump to a subroutine and they come back to the next line underneath it, basically. And then he's got the button released here. I think this is the very beginning. Yes, yeah, see, see, this starts off the main part. So before you do anything, if you're not pressing the button, it's going to keep executing the code over and over again. But once you press the button, then it's going to go to the next um, part of the program there. So button release, branch is not equal. We're going to display the title. So right now, if the button's not pressed, we're going to go down to display title, which he's got right here for display title. I could probably use this little window over here. I was minimizing this so we can get all the code on the screen, but let's take a look here. Go over here to display title. And it's in this one, breakout. So you just click on it like that and double click. Takes you there. And this is the title screen um, that he created that drew the, 
the breakout message on the screen. He's using uh, zero page pointers here. I, I, I like how you did this. See, color the black screen, title one. So I'd have to take a look. I think he might have just drew in the data or something. Like I said, I'll do my best to try to take it apart, but okay, here we go. Title, title one. Yeah, so I think he's just like kind of plotting the positions on the screen. If I'm mistaken on that, Darren, um, go ahead and correct me or whatever, but just taking a stab at it. But essentially, we've got the, the paddle moving on the screen here, which is after the after you press the button, it just goes down to the next line, essentially, which moves the paddle on the screen and starts right here. So it skips over all this other code and goes right here and starts... Um, moving the paddle, or allowing you to move the paddle. I think this is our moving, yeah, this is the controllers for the joystick, allowing the paddle to be moved. So this is basically the simple joystick routines. And here you got the paddle left, obviously enough. And then you've got, um, this is the most significant byte. I think this is, he's saying, don't toggle MSB, so I'm assuming this means that you haven't yet gone past the 255th mark on the screen because the screen the sprite is going to go from 0 to 255 and it kind of starts over again as it flips that bit to get to the high bit and that's essentially what's going on there and it just checks it I think this is was the code we were originally working on if I'm not mistaken um, move the paddle right and it kind of just repeats and reverses everything that we just saw a second ago there okay let's take a look here like I said, I'm just kind of, you know, going through it and skimming through it here. Move the ball. This is going to move the ball. You see this is moving it horizontally because the ball is basically going up the screen there. Horizontally means that go up and down and vertically means to go across this way. So essentially that's what we have going on there. And... These are just tracking the different positions. So we've got the horizontal, vertical. This is moving the ball to the left. Whenever you hit it, it moves the ball to the left. And the ball is just not moving over to the left. It's actually moving to the left and it's moving up at the same time. So it's actually taking control of two different routines at the same time. Okay, and this just checks the collision. And if it hits the wall, which is what this DIRX means, and this is basically controlling whether it, where the ball is moving, whether it's moving up or down. The direction of X, actually that would be backward and forward, excuse me, for the X, and there's one for the Y, up and down, and so forth. Okay, um, and then he's going to create a sound here. So if you go to sound bounce here, sound bounce, right here, he just basically set the um, subroutine that creates the little bonging sound effect for the ball bouncing bong effect or what you want to call it. And then just going back here again. And here's where the ball moves up the screen. So decrement just basically means moving traveling up the screen. Compares it to 50 to see if we hit the ceiling. So the top of the screen is um, set to 50. Otherwise it would be going right off the screen like into the border or whatever at that point. So just kind of keeps the ball in range and stuff like that. Um, Let's see. Hit ceiling. Oh, this is where once it, I believe, yeah, once it's equal to 50, hit ceiling is going to jump down to this code here. And this is going to reverse the ball's direction. So if it's hit the ceiling, it's coming back down toward us. And essentially, it creates a little sound again, sound bounce once it hits the wall. And then basically, it finishes out this code and goes back to the routine again. See, move paddle, move ball. And then also, just like I said, I'm just kind of jumping and skimming around in this, but if you want to take a look, um, it's available there for you. Uh, let's see, so this is hitting the floor, so basically, um, once the ball hits the bottom of the floor, it's tracking that. It's going to create the sound song, sound for bing. It hits the sound like bing or whatever. You heard it as it hits the, the bottom there. Basically, if it's hitting the floor, um, you miss the ball. If I'm understanding correctly. 
So decrement the ball count, yeah, so this is going to increase the ball count. And then it's going to display the ball count. So it's going to update that status score we saw over here. I don't know if I still have it running or not. It's going to basically update this right here, this section for the ball. And let me minimize this a little bit. And then after that, it's going to check the ball count to see if we're equal to zero. So basically, if you've got um, down to zero, then the game is over. So, okay, and this is a rest ball. Let's see what that is. Set X coordinate, Y coordinate, set ball moving downward. So this is um, moving the ball downward. Okay. I'm just taking a look at something here real quick. Okay. And kind of skipping over here. So once the game is over, we're already seeing the screen right here. So this is the screen that you're looking at right now. This is going to basically set the sprites and turn off the sprites, set all the bits to zero. And <coughs> it's going to display a message here. You can see this by the, I believe it's going to probably display this. Press fire to play. I can probably look that up real quick and find out. Game over text right there. Oh, it's, it's doing the game over. I see it's right there. It's doing this game over. And then it's doing the press fire to play, so it's reading the high and low bytes of that. Okay, let's see, you lose your spot here. Okay, so right here's where we are. So at this point, it's going to update some colors here for something. I'm assuming it might be just the text colors or something. That's just a guess. Um, and then we go back, we wait the frame, and update the joystick button again. Check to see if it's released, and this will restart the game over again. If you press the fire button, press fire to play. Otherwise, it just stays in the loop right here. It just keeps jumping back. Jump to start game. Looks like that's an endless loop. I'm not quite understanding that. But anyways, the next part here is the collision. So whenever the ball collides with one of the background characters here, it's going to check that collision here. Sprite Vic collision. So it's just basically checking the sprite collision. And he's masking it with one. That's basically or and it one one is basically saying that it's hit a block here, and it's hit the um, is that the seventh bit or whatever. Okay, and then next um, after we do that, um, see so check sprite collision. Oh, he's just going down here. So to say, once you've got the collision, we're going to go down here, and then I think this might be resetting it. I'm not mistaken. So. Anyways, it's self-explanatory. So basically, you just check in this screen right here and check in to see, well, when the game runs, check in to see the collisions in the game as it's hitting a block, basically, and updating it and resetting the counter and stuff like that. And here's where it's checking the background collision. So this one might have been the paddle. Yeah, check for ball paddle, sprite collision. So when the ball comes down, it's hitting the sprite paddle. If I pay attention to the comments. Okay. So check for ball background collision, and it's going to hit one of the squares here, and we're going to set that VIC register to check it. And if there's a collision there, then it's going to calculate the ball's X character. I want to see what that is. I need to expand this a little bit. Check if the sprite's MSB set. So just basically check in to see if the... Um, most significant bit is set. Then set rotate in the carry bit. I'm trying to see what this is doing. Character ball X character. Is collision. Checking to see if it presses one of these. So I don't probably get exactly what his logic is in that. 
since I didn't write this part of the code, but he says check for ball background collision. And here it's doing some calculations for the X character and the Y character. <coughs> Excuse me. But probably can get back to Darren on that. The whole point isn't explain the entire program. I just wanted to kind of spit out little pieces of what I can hopefully consume at the moment. Calculate XY parameters to erase the brick. So here's where he's doing the erasing of the bricks and stuff like that if you want to follow that in the code there. And then we're steering, um, steering, clearing the collision bit. So once it's hit a uh, square here, it's going to need to reset that collision back to zero so it can get ready for a new collision. And flip vertical direction. So once it hits this, it's going to move the ball in the other direction, which is what we did with this DRRY to kind of flip the, um, the value to positive, negative, and I believe zero is one of them too. It just basically you can have these numbers set up to control which direction you want the ball moving in. And so the ball is out of collision. We're moving it vertically. I think this is being done four different times for the speed, if I'm not mistaken. Calculate the brick points. So it's basically update the score here. So if we go there, we could probably see just see calc brick points right here. I see the score. Outputs point value to brick points. Cause routines update total score, add score. So yeah, this is where he's updating the score and everything. Trying to see his logic here. Y character, compare nine, compare seven, compare eight. I think he might be comparing the numbers or something. Say brick points. So he's probably saving this for the high score or something like that. I'm guessing that's probably what this save brick points is. Let me see. Save brick points. Store it in brick points. He's keeping track of the variable or the label for brick points. That's what it means by storing. It means it's keeping track of it just like a variable would in basic. And then here's where he's doing the score. So it's add score. That's where the score is. And he's going to display it, of course. So we'll go to add score. Here's where he's um, adding the score. Keep track of the, the calculation so we can get the accurate score. And he's setting the carry bit so the carry is over the next number because once it reaches, um, what is it, 99, it has to flip over to the next character. Okay. And then, of course, you know, display the score right here at the bottom. This is going to display it out to the screen here. So we were basically keeping track of it right here where it's adding to the score. And then once, this, once it uh, calculates the score here, it's going to take this calculation and it's now going to display it in the, um, the ones, tens, one hundreds. See, the ones, tens, one hundreds. One tens, hundreds, thousands, place or whatever. That's just basically how the the layout is for scoring. So this is a simple score routine. I'm not going to sit there and try to, you know, take this one down. But just for so you can take a look at it, there's a, a score routine that works. That's kind of cool. And. Drawing bricks. So here he's basically drawing a row of bricks. Here's where he gets the whole bricks drawn on the screen here. Trying to see how he did his draw brick. Let's go to draw brick here for a second. Draw brick row. Draw brick. So it keeps track of um, brick text. He's getting high low bytes for these. And he's displaying it with this. So, what is brick text? Right here's the brick text. So that might be the um, characters for I don't really understand that right now. But just kind of on a lower level of things, you know, it's drawing the bricks in that section. 
I said I didn't really spend time to really go through so I didn't really know I was going to even do this but I decided just to do it for Darren's um, Darren's um, case or whatever because I really appreciate you know his input and his assistance with everything so that's uh, pretty much the gist of the program I don't really know if I missed anything in here I think we've got everything we've got the sounds there's where I was clearing the sound of course and then everything at the bottom here these are just all the the high and the low bytes for the screen memory here for example and there's the sprite data so basically what he's doing is he's drawing out the sprite data here for the I think this is the ball character I think that's the only sprite no, no, the paddle was the sprite. The paddle and the ball, those are the two sprites. I think I'm starting to remember now. But anyways, like I said, it's just a simple video to kind of go over that for you. I wanted to kind of share the news of what's going on with the project and stuff like that. Um, I was going to kind of throw in this one, but I didn't want to, like, confuse people. But I'm going to probably show this in the next video. Um, pretty tired today. I mean, I get it up tonight. But I just wanted to throw out a video there for you guys and keep this one short. I don't really like making them super long. And sorry if I wasn't more prepared, but it's not like I sat down with Darren and talked about this. He just sent it to me and I thought, um, I'll give him, you know, his um, moment of fame here. So here you go, Darren. So um, we're still working on, of course, the machine language project. So just a video, just um, try to keep the channel going consistently. Um, I've got that out there for you. And to kind of reiterate here again, um, what I really want to know is if you're interested in the, uh, not just the Commodore 64 stuff, but if you're interested in the Atari stuff and you want to see me do some Atari videos on my other channel. Of course, we're not going to mix it up with this one. Let me know. Um, I'll see what, if I can come up with something for that. Um, may not be able to do it as much as I'd like to, but I'll try to do it, you know, a little bit here and there if I can. So I think that would be kind of um, a cool thing. But at the same time, I'm still doing the Commodore 64 stuff, so I'm pretty consumed with this right now and very determined to get this um, project moving forward. I'm really looking forward to what Siggy has coming, and we've seen the scrolling example. I mean, pretty amazing, I think, already, and I think really soon we're going to be able to take that map, throw it out. Now I have to line up some of the character data to make sure that the coding is matching, so when we do the collision detection, everything is actually going to work and be able to communicate properly with the program itself. Um, without that, though, if you just sit there and draw a map on the screen, if you're not you know, breaking it up and saying that these characters are for this or these characters are, are you know, reserved for this, then the computer has no way of knowing what that character data is going to do. You basically have to say, I have um, a character A, for example, and I want that to be a wall. I have a character like a pound sign, for example, and I want that to be a, a like a part of the, the cavern or whatever. And then those are the different things. You could say you have maybe an exclamation point as an example, and that could be a ladder. So that's how the computer is going to understand that these characters are responding to the the machine language program in, in routine. That's basically how it all boils down to is you set up this table list and the computer can go through this table list. I'm sure Siggy's going to probably go over that more later. And it can scan this table list to get the information out needed whenever it's bumping into a wall, like a character bumps into a wall, or if he crosses over something, the computer's going to be able to read these characters and say, what's underneath these characters? Um, now, I did a program on this a uh, very long time ago to show you as I was reading under the characters, as I was moving the mouse around, could show you that it was picking up the background. Basically, it was picking up what's what's going behind the scenes. So I think it was just a simple example where if you move the, the sprite over a, a bunch of letters, I had like alphabet letters on the screen, you could see it was de detected. That's the same thing that's happening here. Except at this point, we're going to be assigning these characters to numbers so we can essentially make this start working together. So that's probably some of the next steps we're moving toward. Eventually we're going to have to get the sprites together and you know all that stuff. It's a lot of work. You know, we get the title screen going together, the sound, but we got some great people. And like I said, if you're still interested in joining, let me know. Um, let me know kind of, it's probably also really important for me to mention right now, I need to know, kind of know where your experience level is because I mean, I'll admit, I'm no genius with machine language. I do understand it can follow some of the things. But from game perspective, I do understand that. I've made a lot of games, so I kind of understand the dynamics of how a game goes. And 
yeah, so if you want to join, let us know. I mean, we're going to keep this rocking and just keep this moving along. I'm just getting all excited about this. So you guys have a great night. Thank you for watching. Oh, and before I forget, as always, I appreciate your subscriptions, everything. You guys mean so much to me. You can share this channel. Uh, I'm just I'm blown away by what I see going on with this channel right now. I'm just suddenly seeing it crossing over. You know, it's just it's basically... If you can use that word, it's crossing over, basically. It's crossing the other dimensions I never thought it would, you know. I almost forgot to show you that, but i probably better do that real quick. Or... So I just shrink the screen just a little bit if you're still watching. Um, so I mentioned this in the video, and I was going to show this. Um, so this is um, just a little blog, or basically somebody called it a blurb that actually came out. I had no idea that this was going on, that somebody had actually put my YouTube channel in this little publication, whatever this is, an article or whatever. So that's cool. But like I said, I'm still waiting on Commodore Free Magazine, and maybe that could be the, the whole difference. Um, as I mentioned before, it is still my dream one day to make this a digital platform where people could come through here and we could build projects, hopefully once a week, but I don't think we'll get one done that quick. I mean, if we could really start putting together, I think the more we do this, the easier it's going to get over time. Just like anything, if you work hard enough at it, eventually you're going to learn stuff and be able to do stuff faster and faster. So it would be really awesome if we could maybe build a game in, I don't know, two or three weeks, I don't know, something simple and maybe a more complicated game in a month or two or whatever, how long it would take. So that is my dream. So we'll see where that's going. But I'm going to thank you guys for watching so much and keep on rocking.